Okay, so our basically the distance from origin to where it's located. So this would be our initial position, theta initial. If this is where it stops at the 90 degree mark, this would be our final position, theta final. If it rotates from the positive x-axis, its change in position is positive because we're going from positive 0 degrees to 90 degrees. So our change in position is final minus initial. So what's our change in angular position there of our cork or our popper? See? 90 degrees. And that would be positive. If instead our poplar started here and then rotated to 3 pi over 2, or 270 degrees, our change in position here, we're going from 0 to negative 90 degrees. So our change in position, if we start here and move in the opposite direction, Change in position is negative 90 degrees. Okay, so what that tells us in terms of directions. If we move counterclockwise from the x-axis, we move in the positive direction, we rotate in the positive direction. If theta is measured clockwise, in the opposite direction from the x-axis, the angular position is negative. So usually in physics we've been measuring angles and degrees. For this unit, we'll be measuring angles in radians. So the units for angular position should be radians. If we're given degrees, like in our little example over here on the right-hand side, we can convert. So our conversion factor if we're told that it makes one revolution that's the same as 360 degrees, which is the same as 2 pi radians. All of those are equivalent statements. We rotate once around a circle, that's 360 degrees, 2 pi radians, or one revolution in terms of words. So for example here, if our change in position is negative 90 degrees, to find delta theta in the right units, we have to convert to radians. So you want degrees in the denominator and radians in the numerator. So that degrees will cancel out. There's 360 degrees and 2 pi radians. So that's a trick. You didn't have to memorize the unit circle. If you knew the degrees, you could just convert by dividing it by 2 pi in your calculator. Only you knew this two months ago, right? You couldn't use a calculator? No. Oh, okay. It makes sense. Okay, so you can leave it in terms of pi. In physics, we tend to write things in terms of decimals, which is probably going to be hard for you to get used to. I just did this wrong. It's 1.6 radians. Negative 1.6 radians. Wait, so we have to change the vertical number. That's a great question. So unless you're taking sine, cosine, or tangent of an angle, what mode your calculator in doesn't actually matter. Oh, so, it doesn't. so it doesn't matter. Nope. Don't need to change the mode on your calculator. 
Great question. So negative 1.6 radians. All right, so that's how we figure out the change in position of an object in terms of degrees and radians. We can also figure out how far that object has traveled. We call that the arc length, S. We can find the linear distance it traveled by multiplying that change in angular position by the radius of the circle. So circumference is 2 pi times the radius. If you want the distance along an arc, a smaller amount, not the whole circle, we take whatever the change in angular position is and multiply it by the radius. So that's our next term. We call that arc length. So if we don't move around the entire circumference of a circle, we call that an arc. To figure out the length of that arc, we multiply r times self Okay, so I kind of have that image over here on the diagram already. But this is our arc length. This is how far we've traveled linearly. Here's the radius of our circle. This is our change in angular position. So the variable for arc length, we use a lowercase s. Arc length is lowercase s. So to find arc length, or what arc length is, it's a linear distance traveled by an object that moves in a circle. The linear distance that an object travels around a circular path. Okay, the units for arc length are meters, just like circumference. The units are meters, so linear length. And when we're measuring delta theta, it must be in radians. So angular position must be measured in radians in order for this equation to work. Which is the SI unit. The equation to find arc length distance traveled around the outside of a circle. We multiply the radius r by delta theta. Okay, so let's try an example. Okay, so suppose I walk 15 meters around a circle that has a radius of 10 meters. What's my angular movement and radius? Okay, so here's our circular path of motion. I walk 15 meters around a circle that has a radius of 10 meters. So what does 15 meters tell you? What variable? Okay. <laughs> yeah, the linear distance that we traveled around the path is our arc length. So that tells us our arc length s. So basically that tells us the exact linear distance that we walked. And we walked that distance around a circle whose radius is 10 meters. So what we're looking for, we walk from here to here. So to figure out our change in angular position from here to here, we know that this length is 15, the radius is 10, we want this change in position. So we can use the arc length formula to figure that out. 
We know that the linear distance around the outside of the circle must be equal to the radius of the circle times the change in the angular position. R times delta theta. So we're plug in what we, we know and solve for delta theta. So our arc length is 15 meters. Our radius is 10 meters. We're looking for delta theta. They're connected by multiplication, so we can divide both sides by 10. Anyone notice anything over here on the left-hand side? Julian? The meters cancel out. The meters cancel out. So we're unitless. What do you think those units are? Yep. Radians. So radians is an implicit degree, uh, of implicit unit. So you multiply meters times radians, you just get meters. So you have to know and remember that delta theta is measured in radians. So 10 divided by 15, sorry, 15 divided by 10, we get 1.5 radians, which is about 90 degrees. If I diagram this off a little bit, we'd probably end up like over here somewhere. So about a fourth of the path we've walked so far. 1.5 radians. Okay, so this is how we figure out the linear distance, or how we find our change in position from linear distance. Objects that move in a circle, their position changes, but they also have velocity. Okay, so we're talking about what that velocity is and how we figure that out. The velocity is dependent on how long it takes to rotate one time around, which is called the period. So we're first going to talk about what a period is before we can derive the velocity equation. So objects that rotate in a circle it obviously takes some time to do that. That time associated with moving in a circle is called a period. The variable for period is a capital T, not a lowercase t. They mean two different things. Lowercase t is time, capital T is period. That's funny that they, isn't that a saying, period t, right? Or am I wrong? <laughs> Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. So you remember it. Period T. Variable. Okay. Anyone know what a period is? I think I associate period with time. Okay. So each of our class periods is how much time? Okay. A span of time. Sadie? That's like basically how much time. Okay, so they're all, each period that we have in the day is the same amount of time. So it's the time it takes to get through one class period. It's the same. It's a constant amount of time. So that's what period is. It's a constant amount of time. So that period is the time it takes to make a rotation. So period is the time it takes a particle, particle to complete one revolution, meaning it travels one circumference, 2 pi r. So it moves around the outside of the circle one singular time. The time it takes to do that is called the period. And the units for period are seconds. They're the same units as time. So that makes it the same thing as t. Mix them up. So time it takes for one revolution. If we're not given the period directly, we can calculate it. So period itself, to calculate it, we take the time and we divide by revolutions. That would give us the period. So for example, Okay. 
If our rubber stops, we be rotated around a circle four times. Okay, so we rotate around the circle four times. If it takes four seconds to make four rotations, so rubber stopper rotates four times in four seconds, our period, we take four seconds, we divide by four revolutions, four over four, we get one. So it takes one second per revolution. One second per revolution. Okay, so that period helps us figure out what the velocity of the object moving in a circle would be. Which we call the tangential speed. The variable we use for tangential speed is actually the same variable that we use for velocity. We just add a subscript there. So the t in tangential is a subscript t. So our tangential speed, v sub t, is the speed at which an object moves around a circle. So it's the rate of travel of a circulating, circulating object is tangential velocity. So we're going to use a definition of velocity to figure out this equation here. So this is the speed at which it moves around the circular path. The linear speed it has when it moves around the circular path. So what is velocity? Go ahead. Displacement over time. Displacement over time. So change in position over time. What's the change in linear position when we move around a circle once? What's that called? The change in position or the length. Of the outside of a circle. What's that called? Zoe? The circumference. So our velocity, when we're talking about a circle, it's the circumference of the circle divided by the time it takes to move 2 pi r, which we call the period. So we're talking about an object moving in a circle. That velocity is the circumference of the circle divided by the period. So in equation form, circumference is 2 pi times the radius divided by the period, which is capital T. So that is our equation for tangential velocity. We divide circumference by the time it takes to move that circumference. That gives us the velocity. All right, so we're going to try one example before we look at this in a lab-based situation. So back to our, our rubber stopper rotating in a circle. We have a 0.5 kilogram mass attached to a 1.5 meter string. It is whirled in a horizontal circle. So I'm going to wave up like this, like a lasso. The stopper completes each revolution in 0.5 seconds. Find the tangential speed of the stopper as it moves in a circle. Alright, so I don't know what's important. So 0.5 kilogram mass. I guess this whole thing is important up here. Yeah, the only thing that you can really cut out is the last segment of the word problem. So a 0.5 kilogram mass attached to the end of a 1.5 meter string. 
the software completes each revolution in 0.5 seconds, find the speed. So let's break this down. Let's talk about what we're given. So 0.5 kilograms is the mass. That actually doesn't help us with this one. That's something that we're given. What about the string is 1.5 meters? What does that tell us? The string is 1.5 meters. Ryan? The radius. The radius. The radius of that path has to be the length of that string, 1.5 meters. Okay, the stopper completes each revolution in 0.5 seconds. <coughs> See? The period. So period is time per one revolution. It takes 0.5 seconds to make one revolution. So that's our period. And what we're looking for is the velocity, the tangential velocity. Okay, so our equation, tangential velocity is the circumference, 2 pi r over the period, the time it takes to make that revolution. Okay, so 2 times pi times our radius, which is 1.5, units need to be meters. They're given to us in meters, so we don't need to convert. And the period is 0.5 seconds. When you type this into your calculator, this whole thing in the numerator needs to be in parentheses. You must put a multiplication sign in between the two and the pi. If you just type in two pi, it doesn't multiply them. So two times pi times 1.5, close parentheses, divided by 0.5. You should get 18.9, someone checking there? 18.9. Units are meters per second. It's a linear velocity. Units are meters per second. Okay, so to kind of help understand and put tangential velocity into perspective, we're going to do a lab activity where we look at the velocity of a tumble buggy as it moves in a circular path. So on the way into class, we took a handout off the table. We're going to transition to that handout. Chris, you're going to do a virtual version, so I'm going to post it in Google Classroom for you. So this next part um, will really apply, or actually, this next part will apply to you, Chris, but the part that follows, I'll let you know when you can get started on the virtual version. Okay, so on your way in class, you grab the handout. We're basically going to calculate the tangential velocity of our buggy when the radius changes. So take a second, you're going to read through the background information. What I want you to do is come up with a purpose, so explain what the purpose of our lab is, and then a hypothesis statement. Read the background, come up with a purpose, and a hypothesis for the lab.
Okay, so Chris, your version of this lab is posted in classroom. Um, we're going to talk about live engineering so far. It'll be posted in the next Alright, let's talk about the, the purpose. So, what's the purpose of this experiment? What are we looking for? What are we finding? What are we calculating? The tangential velocity. So basically the speed that it has when it moves around a circle. Okay, so find tangential speed for what? Three different three guys using motorized time. Okay. We're going to find tangential speed for the cello buggy for three different radii. So, four of radius, three different radii. Okay. So, hypothesis statement. If then because statement between the if and the then goes the independent variable. So what's the independent variable here? What's the variable that we're changing from trial to trial? Isabella? The radii. The radii. So if the radius decreases, you can say increase, decrease, or or, yeah, increase or decrease in this case. So we're changing the radii, it needs to change. So it's going to lead to either increase or decrease. So if the radius decreases, then comes our dependent variable, the variable that we measure. So what are we measuring here or calculating here? Sadie? The tangential speed. Then the tangential speed will. So then you're going to fill in that blank. Your options are increase, decrease, stays the same. Because why you think so. So what do you think will happen to the tangential velocity, the speed of the buggy, if we change the radius? Will the speed of the buggy change? Will it increase? Will it decrease? Will it stay the same? Will it stay the same? And I explain why you think so. The decrease in radius, is that just shortening how long we're measuring it for? We are shortening the length from the center of the circle to where the car is located. Oh. So that's our radius r, the radius of the circular path. 
we're going to make that radius shorter each time. Okay, so this is a prediction. You may be wrong, you may be right, that's okay. That's what science is all about. So what do we think? Go ahead. Okay, so if radius um, decreases less of a path, so more positive. Okay, Brian, what do you think? I think it'll stay the same because both the period and circumference will increase, so it's like a ratio to each other out. Okay, so if radius changes, period might change as well, which will keep the velocity the same. Okay. Other thoughts? Anyone say decreases? I'm, okay. So for someone who says that it decreases, why could that also be logical? Look at the equation. So if Jackson thinks smaller radius, larger velocity. Brian thinks that as we decrease radius, period will decrease, so velocity will stay the same. What about someone who thinks decreasing radius would decrease velocity? It's possible if you look at the equation. So all three responses sort of make sense. Where the line is maybe Let's figure out which one is actually true. So to do that, we're going to tie our buggy to a string to force it to move in a circle. Okay, so you do this naturally when you drive a car. Turning the wheel causes your car to move in a circular path of motion. This steering wheel doesn't actually work, so we can't do that. We have to tie it to a string to force it to move in a circle. So what we're going to do is you're going to first Tie the string to the steering wheel. Okay, it must be to the steering wheel, otherwise your, your buggy's gonna flip over. You're gonna measure the length of that string in centimeters. You're gonna record that in your data table. Okay, so let's say that my first length of my string is 91 centimeters. That's an over exaggeration, but I'm gonna measure from my steering wheel to the end of my string. In order to calculate velocity, you need the radius and the period in rotation. So basically, you're going to set it up like a race. You guys can all turn and look back here for a second. If I were to hold the buggy and allow it to rotate around me, the length of your arm, so who's at the center, and also the width of your body would affect the rate of rotation. So to get rid of that variable, we're going to tie the other side of the string to a one kilogram mass so that the length of our radius doesn't match it. So when I set it up kind of like a race, your buggy's going to start on a starting line. So I suggest you use the tile in either the hallway or inside the classroom to be your starting line. You're going to time how long it takes for your buggy to make one or even two rotations. Up to you. So you'll start your timer at the starting line. So release your buggy. You will stop the timer as it reaches the starting line. You're going to record your data in seconds on your data table. So Chris, this is the part that's not useful for you, so you can stop listening to me and start the lab. There's a digital simulation that helps you to calculate or record the data. So let's say it takes 1.2 seconds. Okay, just a number I made up. To make number of cycles, one revolution. Okay, notice that all of our units are in centimeters at first. Okay, so I recorded my radius and the time it took. For that same radius, 
I'm going to try it again. Okay, just to make sure that, right, there's a lot of human error in, in timing. You want to do it a couple times, at least two, to figure out how long it takes. Okay, once you've recorded two trials for your first radius, you're going to change the radius. So an easy way to do that, is to decrease it, make it smaller. So to make your radius smaller, you just add another knot, somewhere a little bit further down, down the screen. You made our radius a little bit shorter. So measuring from the steering wheel to the end of your radius, record that in your table. We're going to do two different trials to record the time. Okay, I'll make the radius shorter one more time. So you're doing three different radii, two different trials for each. So this is 61 and uh, 31. Okay, you'll record your times. Once you have the times, you can go ahead and calculate the velocity. To save some time today, we're going to cross out the column that says frequency. We'll come back to that later. If you time for just one rotation, your period and your time will be the same. To find circumference, there's a review on the back of that page. But circumference, you take 2 pi times the radius. So you're going to multiply this column by 2 pi. To find the velocity, we're first going to find it in centimeters per second. So you'll take your circumference, 2 pi r, and divide by your period. That'll give you your speed. Once you have your speed in centimeters, we're going to convert to meters per second as our last step. How do you convert from centimeters per second to meters per second? Absolutely. So you're going to divide this column by 100. That's going to go in this last column. You're going to round to one decimal place for the last column. Okay, to figure out whether our hypothesis is correct or incorrect, you're going to compare your final values for velocity to see if it increased, decreased, or stayed the same. Are there any questions? Okay, so buggies are on the front table. You'll need string and one kilogram masses. You need at least two people in your group. So you can be in a group of three, but you need at least two people. Three is ideal. Record a starter. And a timer. So we're going to record the data so we can find out how much to start with. So there are two buggies that are kind of already set up. Our materials are on this front table over here. Please feel free to use the hallway.